how many uh, cases of prostate cancer are associated with germline gene that, you know, germline genes that we know are drivers, you know, for example, the equivalent of a BRCA mutation in breast yeah. cancer, or is it virtually all somatic mutation? It is very limited. So there are a class of, of, of um, proteins, molecules that res, uh, affix homologous recombination uh, uh, defects. And those um, HRD classes of, of, of molecules include BRCA1 and BRCA2. The actual protein complex that fixes double-strand DNA breaks is really, really big. So there's lots of different genes that fit within that kind of protein complex that fixes a double strand break. That's what, that's what BRCA1 and BRCA2 do classically. But the most potent of the different genes in that grouping of HRD molecules is BRCA2 for men. So mm -hmm. individual men, it's about 1% or less of the general population have a BRCA2 deficiency, uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 deficiency. Those men are at increased risk for developing breast cancer and prostate cancer. And in the case of prostate cancer, if you develop prostate cancer, it's a, a more aggressive disease course and you have to be very, very careful with individuals who have that deficiency and have prostate cancer. But on average, it's very rare, probably less than 2% of prostate cancer cases, localized prostate cancers diagnosed are attributable to a germline genetic alteration. There are mutations in those same pathways somatically seen within the tumor, right? Not in the germline, but in the tumor yep. that are attributed and related to cancer aggressiveness and progression of cancer. Mm. Um, the classic one, in my opinion, so, so the way I think about prostate cancer in very general terms is you can have localized prostate cancers. These are these lower grade lesions on average. Localized prostate cancers with lethal potential, so LCLP, right? You got a localized cancer with lethal potential. And in my mind, the general genetic trait associated with that transition from localized to localized with lethal potential is an, is something to do with the P10 AKT pathway. Okay. And that doesn't mean that you have a lethal tumor if you have P10 loss, but it, in my mind, it begins to open up the book to say lots of other mischief and nonsense can go on within the tumor. We know from lots of studies that if you have loss of P53, for example, yeah, of course that that's associated with lethal prostate cancer, amplification of MYC. Lethal cancer in general. Yes, yeah. exactly. Amplification of MYC is another one too. It's the emperor Okay, so of it's all. interesting. So basically between MYC and P, P, uh, th uh, P53 uh, and all of KRAS, I mean, I'm that's sure right. KRAS is associated less so, as well. Okay. Less so KRAS, but yes, those are classic markers of lethal cancers. And so prostate is not, you know, uh, yep. you know immune to that as well. Got it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, non-genetic risk factors, or at least non, um, or we can include sort of polygenic stuff that's Im yeah. embedded. So one of the things I always remember from training, African-American men at, at a higher risk, why? Yeah. No one knows. Um, I like to think of, there's a great paper published by this uh, scientist at USC, Chris Heyman, and they looked at um, genomic risk you know, through SNPs for individuals who did or did not develop prostate cancer. There was like 235,000 guys, ton, a ton of individuals. How did they know what SNPs to look at? Well, they did, they, they, there's, a, there's been lots of work in, 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 in single nucleotide polymorphism and risk for prostate cancer. And then this paper was a refreshed look at saying how many SNPs are actually out there associated with risk of developing prostate cancer. Okay. And it's somewhere around 250 or 260, I don't know the exact number, but there's a certain amount. So what they did was they developed a genomic risk score based on how many SNPs you had and your likelihood or probability of developing prostate cancer. And what they showed was that, that although there's no difference between SNP profiles in men of African ancestry, because they could look genomically where their ancestry was, and Caucasians or non-black men um, there was an enrichment for that same group of, you know, of SNPs in black men and an enrichment in y men who were diagnosed with prostate cancer at a young age. So why is it that there's an enrichment of these different portfolio of, of SNPs in black men? 
And why is there an enrichment in the younger men? We don't know, but we, it doesn't appear as though the tumors are profoundly different from a genomic perspective. And we've looked ourselves, we had a series of grants to look at, again, you know, somatic alterations in prostate tumors between black and white men with lethal tumors. We found a difference in the, in the cell cycle gene pathway, but again, these are single percentile differences. Mm. So what exactly is driving the development of more prostate cancers in black men than white men is thought to be at this point kind of environmental. So, you know, what is their exposure to, um, you know, epigenetic changes? What's their exposure to uh, smoking? It's in general in urban, you know, uh, populations of of black individuals, there's more smoking. It has to, it's correlates with the um, food deserts, all these different kinds of epigenetic factors. I see. So it may not actually be hardwired. It's not hardwired. And most of the kind of- That's great news. It is good news. And so, yes, I, I think people would bundle that under this kind of umbrella of social determinants of health. Yep. But you can actually begin to really begin to connect those two ends of what the, are the social determinants and then what is the impact on the SNPs and the epigenetic changes that occur. So I think a great future project would be to take that and look at exposures in, think about it, like your exposures in, a, in an environment with high smoke, high pollution, poor foods, and the epigenetic changes that occur when you're having a surge in your testosterone in your 20s. That begins to hardwire that person's cells for future development of prostate cancer. Yeah. And that's kind of how I think about it now because we did I spent a decade looking for the smoking gun, the heritable germline change. There are some out there but they're not very but they're big not guns. They're not big enough. They're not big enough to be you know associated with that change. And so this paper that Chris did and his team of, you know, there's like 150 authors, this spectacular work. Um, really begins to provide more insights. So this is the UCSD group that led this. UC, USC uh, oh, USC. USC. Okay. Um, Chris Heyman is the last author and um, blanking on the first author's name. Great, we'll, great we'll, publication. We'll link to that yeah. paper. Yeah. So it gives you a sense of, you know, so then why are there different subpopulations of individuals that have different risks? It's likely just enrichments for these single nucleotide polymorphism changes, which by the way, if you look at that paper, if you had the highest, let's say, decile or quartile of SNPs. You had about a five-fold increased risk of developing prostate cancer compared to the average man, which is the same fold increase as if you're BRCA2 deficient. Wow. So having a poor genomic risk score is just as potent as having deficiency in BRCA2, which we know is not good. And the penetrance of BRCA2 and BRCA1 for prostate cancer are how high? Like eighty percent ish? No, lifetime risk is is less than that. A lifetime risk is somewhere on the order of um, sixty to seventy okay. percent. So, so penetrant enough that you treat it enough. As... We would keep our. We would definitely do intensive screening for yeah. them, but it's not a guarantee. But it's are you do you know obviously women that are highly inherit... penetrant and at a very young age. That's yeah, not true but, for men. But in yeah, average. But but you know, it's not unreasonable for a woman to undergo a prophylactic mastectomy. Yes. If she is, uh, if she has a, a deficient copy of the BRCA gene, are any men considering prophylactic prostatectomy? Not at this point, because we the difference is we have very powerful screening tools. Those it tools gets work back to Halstead versus Fisher, and those screening tools work just as well in individuals who are BRCA deficient. So their tumors may be more aggressive when they're diagnosed, but we have very powerful tools to a identify them early and b monitor them once they're picked up. And so it doesn't necessarily change that paradigm, yep. which is different for breasts because you have to wait till you have a visible lesion, which yep. a visible lesion on mammogram is what, 40 or 50 million cells? You know, oh, I, you know I, I mean? I guess closer to a billion. I don't think it's a, a billion. A, a centimeter? Well, well, we'll we'll try to find something for the show notes, but yes, it's yeah. it's a ton of cells. Yeah, yeah. Whereas we have much better tools yeah, yeah, to look at yeah. that with, with the blood test. And, and hopefully, with breast cancer, we're going to see liquid biopsies and cell free DNA adding more to that. Um, As a biomarker, it's definitely you know shows promise. I mean, yeah. there's lots of those liquid things. It's not essential for our space because we have a very good one. Yep. Um, 
another esoteric risk I kind of vaguely remember, and I don't know if I'm remembering it correctly. Is there an inverse relationship between the frequency of ejaculation and the development of prostate cancer? Yeah, there's an epidemiologic study that shows that men who are ejaculating more than 20 times a month, that there was a lower risk of developing prostate cancer. It's never been, you know, that the state, the paper you're remembering is the really the paper on that topic. It still exists. And so what, how big was the hazard ratio? Is it worth paying attention to? And yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't remember because it's so old. I mean, I yeah. certainly don't. You know, I, I don't, you know, to be honest, I've never thought about encouraging, you know, uh, increased ejaculation for the... As, as a my, preventative strategy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's not a bad idea, but I've never, it's never occurred to me to kind of encourage yeah. that. So, and, and, so and it's not, the idea isn't that prostatic stasis in the absence of ejaculation allows something to occur in the prostate that, that leads to the development either through the microenvironment or other genetic issues. I mean, I, I, point is, we have no further insight than that we epidemiologic know, study. But that it's is, not a bad one. I think the converse would be horrific for men. Like, don't ejaculate because it'll lower your risk of cancer. So yeah. it's not. It's like a kind of a win-win, right? Yeah, That's how yeah. I think about it. Okay. So so let's now get into but, the nuts and bolts. So yeah, let's talk about a couple other risk factors um, besides, you know, ancestry. Which is huge. Which is, of B course... Bigger than many cancers. Yes. Um, so it's not just black patients. You know, you have to think about, um, or not just African Americans, but there's a, you know, there's anybody with a West African ancestry is really what is the most significant in that risk factor. And then there's um, other ones. So Ashkenazi Jewish individuals have a much higher chance of harboring, hmm. you know, foundry mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. So I always talk about ancestry and then I talk about all cancer risk, right? When I'm taking a family history, I say, what's your personal history of prostate cancer? And if you have a personal history of prostate cancer, you're meaning a father, uncle, or brother. So first degree relative. Father, uncle, brother. brother. Okay. The number of individuals and the age that they were diagnosed, and we'll put a link in the show note for the table, it increases your full risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer significantly. It doesn't mean you need to change, you shouldn't have a prophylactic prostatectomy, but you should just have intensive, intensive monitoring. That's what we recommend. What about grandfather? Grandfather is not, it's If it first skips the generation, yeah. it doesn't matter. So yeah. your grandfather has prostate cancer, but none of your brother. It's not considered to be a family history of, of prostate. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about grandfather and father? Is that worse than just father? Father is the driver for that. Okay. So family history. Um, so ancestry, um, right. And then family history and then individual patients. So smoking, it is classically linked with breath, uh, with lung cancer and classically linked with bladder cancer, urothelial carcinoma, yes. but smoking is associated with more, the development of more aggressive prostate cancer. So, so not necessarily more prostate cancer, but when you get it, it's worse. Yes. And at a younger age. So the, the correlation is younger age onset, more aggressive cancer. What's with the youngest patient you've ever seen with prostate 34. cancer? 34. That is yeah. staggering to yeah. me. I would have never guessed no, that. I'll never forget that, that, that gentleman's, you know, I, I have his picture in my brain. He didn't survive? He, we treated him um, and he, he lived, he's still alive now, but still, when you have a 34 year old, and the, and his wife sitting there going like what, you know? So I've I've subsequently diagnosed young men with prostate cancer and then subsequently treated their fathers. So they had their cancer before, before their, their father, dads. which is also mind boggling, right? Tell tell me a little bit about this guy's case. What was there was there just some freak gene thing that you know the the youngest man, the thirty four year old, was early in my career at Hopkins, where we had such a lack of understanding of the genetic risks and so forth. So I would love to go back and pull his tumor and you know just sequence the whole thing. But he presented how some, he just presented with a rising. He PSA. went in for a he wanted to get a two hundred and fifty dollar discount on his health insurance for the year, so he got a routine screening through his work, and they picked up a PSA that was like ten, and he's thirty four, and he wasn't from an infection. So. But anything below what is freakish, 50? So the median age of diagnosis for prostate cancer is 68. We would consider early prostate cancer, which would be a criteria for doing genetic screening at around 50. 
Okay. So hereditary could be young age of onset, so 50. Uh, I, I, if, I am, if I'm not mistaken, I believe type 2 diabetes and metabolic disease also increase the risk of they do. prostate cancer as it does breast cancer and endometrial cancer Absolutely. and a number of cancers. Um, and also the aggressiveness and likelihood and probability of recurrence. Okay. All the other things really have never been, you know, fully supported with any decent follow-up studies. So these different products in the skin of grape, you know, broccoli, tomato. Um, oh, you mean as preventive? Yeah, there they really haven't been linked with any real increased or decreased risk for developing prostate cancer. Mm -hmm.